Romans chapter 12 verse 11. Romans 12 11. not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Leviticus chapter six, verse 12, also to verse 13. Leviticus, he said, and the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burnt offering in order upon it, and it shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Hallelujah. This evening, I want to charge our hearts on the subject keys to sustaining personal spiritual revival. Keys to sustaining Personal spiritual revival. We have a twofold objective. First of all, to understand what we mean by personal spiritual revival. And then to understand the secrets of personal spiritual revival. The fire of the altar shall be burning in it. Leviticus 6.13. It should never go out. It should never go out. Beloved, we live in a world that places a very high demand on our spiritual lives. Very high demand. Highly demanding world. A world that make it very easy to run out of spirituality. Very easy. That was what Matthew says in Matthew chapter 24 and in verse 12. He said, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. That is the world we live in. The world where there is an abundance of unrighteousness that is causing the love of God in the hearts of many to run down. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 1, we have read that over and over again. He said this know also. That in the last days, perilous times shall come. That's right. Men shall be lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasures, covetous, bold, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent despisers of them, of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. One of these days I'll be preaching specifically on the times that we are in. 
So I'm going to give more of the details. It will be more like the part two of this message. But for now, this is the world we live in that makes very serious demand on our spirituality. The message today seeks to achieve the following. We want to know what to do. Number one, to keep the altar fire burning. What to do? First, what to do? One, to keep the altar fire burning. Keeping the altar fire burning is what we refer to as spiritual revival. Number two, to maintain spiritual intensity, vibrancy and buoyancy. What do I do to keep the altar fire burning? What do I do to maintain spiritual intensity, vibrancy, buoyancy? It's very true that we're, there are many people who are up today, down tomorrow, and they are wondering what, what's happening. So we want to know what to do, number one, to keep the altar fire burning, which is what is referred to as spiritual revival. Number two, to maintain spiritual intensity, vibrancy, buoyancy. Thirdly, to avoid spiritual dryness and staleness. You know how stale food is? To avoid spiritual dryness and staleness. Fourth, to maintain spiritual freshness and newness. Spiritual freshness and newness. What we need to do to remain spiritually irrigated. Spiritually irrigated. Spiritually irrigated. So that you have, you have the, the, the reign of the spirit. You have the reign of the spirit. You are spiritually irrigated. You are fresh. You are new. Have you come across a person before that appears to be new all the time? Fresh all the time. It's not outdated. It's not antiquated. It's not outmoded. That's what we're talking about. Just new all the time. Bubbling all the time. Fresh water all the time. So we're, we're here to know what to do to keep the altar fire burning. To maintain spiritual intensity, vibrancy, and buoyancy. To avoid spiritual dryness and stillness. To maintain spiritual freshness and newness. That is, to remain spiritually irrigated. Spiritually irrigated. Irrigated. Fresh water. Fifthly, we are here to know what to do, number five, to maintain spiritual momentum, drive, enthusiasm. Spiritual momentum, spiritual drive, enthusiasm. You are not looking for who will push you spiritually. You are not looking for who will tow you spiritually. Highly motivated. Maintaining spiritual momentum, drive, enthusiasm. Sixthly, it is to remain spiritually aware, awake, and alive. That is the sixth thing we are here to do. That is the sixth thing that personal spiritual revival implies. Remaining aware, awake, alive spiritually. To remain spiritually aware, awake, 
alive. You are not in coma spiritually. You are not half dead spiritually. You are not in a state of spiritual death or spiritual coma or stupor. Aware. Awake. Alive. Number seven, we're here to know what to do to remain spiritually relevant, in spiritually relevant, impactful, spiritually relevant and impactful. You are not just there. As a Christian, bench warmer, church goer, spiritually relevant and impactful. That is a man or a woman in spiritual revival. That person has the altar fire burning. That person has spiritual intensity, vibrancy, and buoyancy. That person is, cannot be said to be spiritually dry or stale. That person has freshness and newness in the spirit. He's spiritually irrigated. That person has spiritual momentum, spiritual drive, spiritual enthusiasm. That person is spiritually aware, spiritually awake, spiritually alive. It's not in coma. It's not in stupor. It's not spiritually asleep. The Bible says when men sleep, the enemy is so thirsty. It's not asleep. It's awake. It's revival. And to remain relevant, number seven, to remain spiritually relevant and impactful. To remain spiritually relevant and impactful. So we are here to do all this. To remain spiritually relevant and impactful. What do you do? What are these keys to these seven things we mentioned? What are the keys to keeping the altar fire burning? To maintaining spiritual intensity, vibrancy, and buoyancy? To avoid spiritual staleness and dryness? To maintain spiritual freshness and newness? To maintain spiritual momentum and drive and enthusiasm. To remain spiritually aware, awake, and alive. To remain spiritually relevant and impactful. What do you do? Number one. Maintain brokenness. Brokenness. Hosea chapter 10, verse 13, verse 12. He said, verse 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rain righteousness upon you. Break your fallow ground. Brokenness. A, a, a broken man, a broken woman, is revival in motion. Revival. That arrogant man, that proud fool man, will never know what revival is all about. Being broken before God. Free of pride. Even spiritual pride. Free 
of arrogance is key to maintaining revival. I've discovered through our scripture that brokenness before God is secret of usefulness with God. Five loaves and two fishes were never useful until they were broken. In John chapter 6, verse 11 to 12, we saw he broke the bread. The fragrance of the alabaster box only came out after it was broken. In Mark chapter 14, verse 3, and in John chapter 12, verse 3, Mark chapter 14, verse 3, and John chapter 12, verse 3. In both places, we saw the alabaster box broken. And in the second instance, this fragrance filled the house. You want the fragrance of his presence around your life, it takes brokenness. Before the rain could fall from heaven, in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, the Bible said, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Openness from heaven comes in response to brokenness on the earth. When something or someone on earth is broken, heaven will open. You want the life of open heavens on you, you need to be broken. Maybe you have been wondering why I can't feel God's presence. I can't, I can't see anything out of scripture. I can't, I can't pray and pray very well or very long or even very deep. Maybe you are too intact. The flesh is too solid. Yourself, your ego, your pride, your arrogance. You boast too much. You compare yourself too much. You are quick to say, do you know who I am? Do you know who you are talking to? That kind of climate forbids revival, the maintenance of revival. God uses humble people to achieve his purpose on the earth. The Bible says the weak things of this world, the things that are despised, God has chosen to put to naught those things who claim that they are something. That no flesh should glory in his sight. Hallelujah. Look at that John again, chapter 12, and in verse 3. Verse 3. Then took Mary. A pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed his feet with, with anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. In Mark chapter fourteen verse three, in that scripture, we saw how. And being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper. There came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, of speaking out very precious, and she break the box and poured it on his head. And obviously, the smell of it filled the whole house. Hallelujah. Brokenness is key to usefulness 
in the sight of the Lord. Brokenness is key to usefulness. Now, let's go to point number two. All right, let me read this before we go to point number two. That was Romans chapter one, verse 26. He said, for, sorry, 1 Corinthians 1.26. 1 Corinthians 1.26. He said, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men out of the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the best things of the world and things which are, are despised has God chosen here. And things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Let's look at verse 26 of the same scripture um, from the New Living Translation or the Living Bible. Any of the two. That no flesh should glory in his sight. You say, remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose despised those things, chose things despised by the world. Things counted as nothing at all and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. Hallelujah. God wants to bring you to a point where you cannot boast. And if you are at that point where you have nothing to boast about, then you can be used mightily. You can experience revival. Even if you are important in the eyes of the world, make yourself of no importance before God. Even if you are wise in the eyes of the world, make yourself foolish before God. Even if you are something before men, make yourself nothing before God. Then he will use you to his glory and you will see revival. Maintain brokenness. Number two, maintain permanent hunger. Permanent hunger. And that is hunger for God. Hunger for reality. Maintain permanent hunger. He said in Matthew chapter 5 verse 6, hey, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Psalm 63 verse 1 to 2, he said, O Lord, my God, oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsted for thee. My flesh longeth for thee. In a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. To see thy power. And to see thy glory as I have seen. That is hunger. We run out of revival when we run out of hunger. We run out of revival when you run out of hunger. We run out of fire when we run out of desire. Please never get to the point where you are over familiar with God. Never get to the point where you have become too used to God. Remain a stranger with him. Never get to the point where you are satisfied with what you have achieved with God. <laughs> Never get to that point. Never get to that point. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 3, when 
Elisha told the, 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 the woman, he said, go borrow the vessels, the prophet's widow are brought of all thy neighbors. Even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art coming, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shall pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. You shall set aside what is full. You know the meaning? To agree to be satisfied is to be set aside by God. Never come to the point where you are satisfied with everything you have seen in God. I'm not saying you should grumble or we should be discontent in terms of that realm. That's not but I'm talking about spiritual hunger. We will never see the fullness of everything we are meant to see in this life until we see him face to face. So until you see Jesus face to face, there is still an, a face, a level, a realm. There is still something he wants to do with your life. So maintain that permanent hunger for God. When Moses first encountered God, the Lord said, don't come too close. <laughs> Pull your shoe from where you are and don't come too close. Remain there. Don't get too familiar. Don't, 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 don't get too used. <laughs> I want to do something in your life. Don't get over familiar. Remain there. Don't, don't get, don't, come, come, come not nigh hither. Take off your shoes. For where thou standest is holy ground. Maintain permanent hunger. And don't agree to be satisfied with where you are. Number three, pray without season. That is verbatim from scripture. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 13. He said, 517, First Thessalonians 517, pray without season. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18. It says, I'm praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Pray without ceasing means pray like you eat. In fact, more than you eat because you don't eat endlessly. It's more literal to say pray like you breathe. Pray like you do the essential things of life. Pray like your heart beats. When prayer fire goes down, spiritual life goes down. When prayer fire goes down, revival fire goes down. Let me say this and don't forget it permanently. Your spiritual life is literally irrigated by your prayer life. The way you water plants with water. That is how your spiritual life is watered by prayer. Especially prayer in the spirit. That was what he said in John chapter 7 verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this is spake of the spirit, which they that believe on him shall receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So the Holy Ghost flows out of your belly as a river. Is the flowing of a river. And the purpose of river is to irrigate lands. Irrigate lands. Irrigate seeds. Irrigate trees. Your spiritual life is irrigated by your prayer life. 
That is why every time prayer begins to decay, spiritual life begins to dry. Every aspect of your spirituality dries up with the drying up of your prayer life. You must have noticed a connection between praying and studying the word. Whatever you do to make you pray, there is um, a, a prayer tape they call tongues of fire that uh, you just put in and then pray along with. It's possible. But never let your prayer life go down. That is, pray without season. Number four. I hope that's number four. Number four, maintain the consecration of fast. That's right. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31. If you let's start from verse 29. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 29. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no mighty increased strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fail. But they that wait upon the Lord, waiting on the Lord is what we know, we know as fasting and prayer, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Waiting on the Lord is a spiritual strength renewal exercise. It's a spiritual fire renewal exercise. It's like when military people go on, a, on exercises, bush exercises. They go on camps. They go on just, 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 just to keep themselves in shape for urgencies. Exercises. Paul the Apostle was a man of permanent revival. And he was a man of permanent fasting. Second Corinthians chapter, chapter 11 verse 27. Second Corinthians chapter 11 verse 27. He said, talking about his accomplishments, he says, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger, in thirst, in fastings often. We can stop there. That was the man, Paul the Apostle, who was the embodiment of revival. Anywhere Paul arrived, it was revival that arrived. Anywhere Paul arrived, it was God and his visitation. You know, there are people when they arrive, it's not only them that came. Who they carry came. A host of angels arrived with them. That was Paul. And he was in fasting. So maintain the consecration of fast once a week, twice a week, according to what your schedule is, a fasted life. I know of many people who find it very difficult to eat anything before 12. That is, I mean, it's, it's not that they are fasting. That's just regular, you know. But just whatever is convenient and comfortable with you, a day in a week, tw twice a week, minimum, let's say, anything between morning to one, two, three, or a whole day morning till evening. Perfect. Just, just to, to reignite passion. You are not fasting for husband, fasting for wife, fasting for child, fasting for money, for food, for anything. You are just, you are just, you are just, you are just, you are just sharpening your spiritual senses. Just, just, just sharpening your spiritual tools. You are just rekindling your spiritual hunger. I've discovered there is a connection between hunger in the stomach and hunger in the spirit, which the fast creates. I, I just discovered personally. All right? So it's very, very important to maintain that consecrational fast. And then maintain the intake of the word. Maintain. Let me call it the continual intake of the word. In fact, let's make it direct. Maintain the daily intake of the word. Daily intake of the word. The daily intake of the word. Maintain a daily intake of the word. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word 
that proceeds from the mouth of God. Luke chapter 4 verse 4 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. As we live by food in the physical, we also live by food in the spiritual. Not physical food now. Rema, light, insight. When a person is not eating in the physical, he, lo he loses energy, loses strength, loses weight. In fact, loses immunity, malnutrition. Can so make a person susceptible to infections in the same manner. When a person does not eat spiritually, he loses strength, loses energy, loses spiritual weight. Loses the capacity to withstand afflictions. Loses power. This is very, very important. I came across a study that was made, I believe it was in America, where the study of the, the statistics was taken about people's study of the word, that is genera, Okay, between ages 8 and 80. It wasn't an incidental study, and I think they studied like 40,000 people. It wasn't an incident, it was a, they studied deliberately. What is the effect of Bible study daily on the lives of people? This was the discovery. That those who studied the Bible once a week, like those who only opened their Bible during church service. And then after that, they didn't, see it. they didn't go through the Bible again till another Sunday. It says the Bible had, it had very negligible effect on key areas of their lives. Key areas, talking of key areas. Those who studied twice a week, the effect was negligible, wasn't noticeable. Those who studied three times a week, no much change, still negligible. But from four times a week, it began to spike drastically. Noticeable change. Now, it looks like it was even a random study. I'm not sure that it was even Christians particularly. Just study, read the Bible daily. Let's see. And those who study from four times a week and above, this was the finding. First, the feeling of loneliness drops dropped by 30% for those who studied up to four times a week and above. So next, anger issues, anger, anger, anger dropped by 32%. Next, bitterness issue dropped by 40%. That is, it became easy to forgive people. By studying the Bible daily, four times a week, I mean, from four times to five times to six times to seven times. Then, alcoholism consumption. That's why I told you the study must have cut across. Dropped by 51%. That is somebody who said, I, 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 I'm unable to, to stop drinking. He studied the Bible today, to, tomorrow, next tomorrow, the third day, the fourth day. From then on, it began to drop. Pornography issues. Because we live in such a world today where people are battling Christians, several people, several people. 60% drop. That is, I can't stay away from watching bad movies on the internet. Drop by 60%. As they study the Bible, listening to Bible-based materials, and were instructed in Scripture daily. Then the positive side. Evangelism drive increased by 200%. That is the desire to win other souls, other people to God. It increased. Personal life discipline and others went up by 23%. Can you see the impact of the intake of the word. 
In case you are studying the Bible and taking it for granted, please don't take it for granted. It's doing something for you. It's doing something. The reason why you are not the, the, the reason why the enemy has not got a hold on your life is because of your discipline. Keep on with it. The reason why you have been able to overcome some temptations that others couldn't is because of that schedule, that routine. And if you are not and you just only went through the Bible just in service or you, you, you just um, whenever you feel like or whenever you have a problem, that's no effect. This is a very, very impactful study. Maintain a daily intake of the word. Number six, maintain righteousness. He said, sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. That was Hosea chapter 10 verse 12. Maintain righteousness. Don't live in sin. Don't live in sin. Don't sleep with unconfessed sin. It hardens your conscience. When you live in sin, when you do things repeatedly and you just begin to feel normal in them, your conscience gets hardened. Your, that's what is called the, your fallow ground. The, your, the ground of your spirituality is hard. That's why I say break it up. It's hard. It's unable to receive any rain from above. It's unable to produce any result. But when you maintain that tenderness of conscience, you can you can you can you, you you cannot be comfortable with the wrong thing. You can't take what belongs to another person and sleep with it and be comfortable with it. You can't lie and be comfortable with it. You can't cheat and be comfortable with it. You're almost going to suffocate when you allow uncleanness in your life. And when you maintain that atmosphere, your revival is, is continuous. But when you are one leg in, one leg out, you are living anyhow, still going to church. Oh, the grace of God covers for me. Yeah. The grace of God covers for you. The Bible says, shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound. God forbid. You cannot maintain righteousness. That is by the maintenance of a clear conscience. By refusal to be used to, to sin. Refusal to be used to unrighteousness. Keeps you in revival. And number seven. Connect with positive influence and inspiration. Positive influence and inspiration. Let there be somebody who challenges your spirituality positively. Might be pastor, might be a mentor, might be a friend, might be somebody whose spirituality positively challenges you. Don't be disconnected from such Positive influence and positive inspiration. You know, it takes iron to sharpen iron. So does a man sharpen the countenance of his friend. Proverbs chapter 27 and in verse 17. Acts chapter 4 verse 13. When they beheld the boldness of... They saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled and they took knowledge of them. That they had been with Jesus. Is there anybody who challenges you? People of, the, of today. People of yesterday. I read Dr. Misenentia. I read T.L. Osborne's um, book the other day. And I read the story of Daisy Osborne. She was, she was in Ghana. They were, she was in Ghana for a crusade. I mean, was in Ghana for a program. I, and I read what, something just, I read something that just provoked me, challenged me positively. That in the morning, she was woken up by the Holy Spirit. 
who told her to go to the government's conference center in the morning, around 5 or 4 a.m., around 5 to 6 a.m. And the writer, who happens to be the husband, T.L. Osborne, said, and as her manner was, she went. <laughs> Oh dear. As her manner was. So it was it was her manner to hear from God and her manner to move. And she went. And as she went, she came into the conference place and they stood there, started praying, waiting for why the Holy Ghost sent her there. Then she saw a woman carrying a baby that was a dead child. And the Holy Ghost told her that was why she came. And she went to the woman and carried the baby. Carried that baby in her arms and began to cry and pray for the baby. Then the baby came back to life. Came back to life, gave the baby to the mother as both of them were rejoicing and celebrating. She only thought that what happened to the baby was coming back to life. Unknown to her, but known to the mother. The baby had been born with only one eye. And just died. The baby came back alive with the other eye. Fully set. <laughs> God restored the life. And, 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 and created an eye. It made me restless. See, there are dimensions of God that people of old have seen. The people of our generation, we have seen some things, thank God. But we need to hear of some things that others have seen and experienced with God that can push us into depths with God. Positive influence. Positive inspiration. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they hung with each other, influenced each other, challenged each other, sharpened each other. Who is your closest friend? Whose voice do you listen to? Water moving with fire? Lion moving with hyenas? Eagles fellowshipping with vultures? The influence around you and the inspiration of your life determines the revival you will see. Beware who speaks into your ears. There are those who, are, who tell you your spiritual life is too much. You are too, your, your own is too much. Huh. When you begin to hear such verses, ask yourself whether you are connected to the right person. And as it pertains to marriage, if you are fire, please don't marry water. Otherwise, it is plus one minus one, which equals to zero. Hallelujah. I think I will draw the curtain tonight. Maintain brokenness. Maintain permanent hunger. Maintain or pray without ceasing. Maintain the consecration of fast. Maintain a daily intake of the word. Maintain righteousness. Connect positive influence and inspiration and you will be in the position to sustain personal spiritual revival to maintain to keep the altar on the fire burning the fire on the altar burning to maintain spiritual intensity vibrancy and buoyancy to avoid spiritual dryness and stillness to maintain spiritual freshness and newness. To remain spiritually irrigated. To maintain spiritual momentum, drive and enthusiasm. To remain spiritually aware, awake and alive. And to remain spiritually relevant and impactful. To remain spiritually relevant and impactful. To remain spiritually relevant and impactful.